Okay, good morning. It's good to be with you guys and to be able to share the Word of God with you. It's kind of awkward being on a video chat like this through Zoom and having everybody uh, watch you this way or listen this way, but honestly, it's really good to be with you and to open up the bread of life and to expound upon the Word of God and allow the Word of God to change our lives and to cause us to be more like Jesus, and to cause us to be better Bible students, and to cause us to think about the loss and try to reach the loss with the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that we live in a sinful and dying world. But before I, we jump into the lesson and before I put up my slides here, I just wanna send my uh, thanks and appreciation uh, to the elders and to the leadership and not, that, not only that, but to all the brethren there at East Foothill for allowing me to be able to speak for you um, on video. So my way of introduction, I'm saying greetings from beautiful Southern California. Um, we're having two worship services going on right now. We have ours going on in the auditorium. And then you have uh, here in the classroom, this is one of our classrooms here, um, my wife and I. So this morning, it feels like I'm just preaching to my wife. So uh, hopefully she won't get tired of me, but um, I'm always preaching to her and always sharing ideas with her. And so she's probably used to everything that I have to say. Um, anyway, um, it's, it's good to see you. And uh, for those of you who can see my full outfit, I'm wearing something special this morning. Uh, this is actually the same outfit that I wore uh, 12 years ago. Uh, when I first became the minister there at East Foothill as a young kid, as a 23-year-old. And I'm not going to tell you my age now. You can do the math. If I was a 23-year-old then, it, you can see how old I am now. And now I have facial hair, but I'm losing hair here. So <laughs> I'm just going to go what God gives me. Uh, this morning, what we want to do and what we want to talk about is some encouraging things. So let me pull up my PowerPoint slide here. And again, hopefully this lesson will cause you to want to search the scriptures more, uh, cause you to want to read your Bible more, and encourage you as you guys are sheltered in, just like myself, um, I'm sheltered in as well. So I'm trying to get my slides up here. Give me a second. We're, we're sheltered in down here as well, and there's really no interaction. And, and a lot of people just need encouragement. And so this morning, I want to try to encourage you. Uh, from the word of God here. Let me get my slides up here and then we'll make sense. All right, perfect. I like to have my slides this way. Um, I like to see the next slide coming, but if you have a Bible, which I know you do, you can go ahead and place a marker there at Luke chapter seven. Uh, Luke chapter seven, we're gonna be looking at verses 18 through 24. And this title of the lesson this morning is Go Tell John. Um, this lesson came about from listening uh, to a song titled Go Tell John. Uh, the song is very encouraging. And the song is actually by one of the members, a leading member of the group a cappella, And it's Keith Lancaster. And this is one of his albums from the 90s. But it's a song titled Go Tell John. And I recommend that you listen to that song in your downtime. Go on YouTube and listen to it or go on Spotify or go on Pandora and listen to the song. And you'll see that the song is very uplifting. And it's something that we need in our lives every day. We need to keep our minds busy uh, during the pandemic. We need to keep our minds busy and focus in on spiritual things at all times. I was talking to Derek yesterday and I told him, you know, with COVID going on and people being bored at their house, uh, you know, people come up with many ways to do evil things because an idle mind or a mind that's sitting is the devil's playground. So we must keep ourselves busy and meditating on positive things, especially the word of God. And so listen to that song on your own time. But let's think about this this morning is, let me see, how come I can't change slides here? Here we go. In, in John, uh, Luke chapter seven and verse 18, we have John hearing about Jesus. John is going to get word about Jesus and the things that Jesus was doing in his personal ministry. So read verse 18 with me. All the, all the verses will be up on the slide. And all my verses are from the New American Standard Bible, the 1977 edition. Uh, so if you're using the NASB, you can follow along. If you're using an ESV, that's fine. New King James is fine. Uh, just follow along in your Bible. Or if you just want to pay attention to the screen, go ahead and pay attention to the screen. But in, in Luke 7 and verse 18, 
John is going to get word. Okay, in Luke 7 and verse 18, we find out that John hears about Jesus. And it says, and the disciples of John reported to him, that is to John the Baptist, about all these things. Well, what are these things? Well, contextually, we know that these things are referring back to Luke chapter 7 and verses 1 through 10, where Jesus healed the centurion's servant uh, who was deathly ill. The centurion had a servant who he cared about, who he wanted healed, and he came to Jesus, and he wanted Jesus to heal his servant, and Jesus heals his servant. Think about that. Keep these things in your mind. That from Luke 7, verses 1 through 10, Jesus heals the centurion's servant, and the centurion is very happy because he loved his servant and he cared for him. The next part from Luke 7, verse 11 through 17, is that Jesus raised the widow's son from his casket. Remember that scenery? Where the woman is weeping because her child, her only child had passed away. And they were carrying that child in the casket through the city. And Jesus sees the woman and has compassion upon her because she loses her only son. And she's a widow at that. And Jesus stops the men from carrying the casket and he raises him up from the casket. Brethren, Jesus is performing great miracles here. And John's disciples saw these things or heard about these things, and they go and tell John about these things. These things contextually, hearing the centur- healing the centurion's servant and raising up this widow's son from a casket, these are great miracles being performed by Jesus. And we need to remember that John the Baptist, brethren, is actually in prison while he gets word. And you might ask the question, well, how is it that John ended up in prison? Well, John ended up in prison because of his hard preaching and his rebuking of Herod Antipas. And we'll talk about Herod Antipas uh, here in a little bit as we look at the next slide. John is in prison for preaching to Herod Antipas. If you read in, in Matthew's account, Matthew 14, verses 3 through 4, here's what John was saying to Herod. And he says, uh, this is what Matthew records about John the Baptist preaching to a Herod. It says, for when Herod had arrested him, see, Herod was upset with John for preaching at him, for preaching the truth and correcting him. He had him bound and put in prison on account of who? Herodias. Now, this is always interesting. Herodias, the wife of his brother, Philip. See, Herod was a bad guy. I mean, you think people are bad guys today, but... Uh, Back then in the first century, Herod was a bad guy. He was such a bad guy and he was such a bold guy that he left his wife, got rid of her because she wasn't pleasing to him and said, you know what? I like my brother's wife better. (laughs) And so he goes and he takes his brother's wife and even taunts it to his brother. You can't do anything about it. I'm more powerful than you. And then John, being the great man that he was, a man sent from God, he preaches to Herod, what you're doing is wrong. And here's what he tells him in verse 4. For John had been saying to him, but this is what John was telling him, not a a one-time thing, by the way. He was saying to him, reminding him and rebuking him and trying to get him on the right path to God. It is not lawful for you to have it's not lawful, lawful for you, Herod, under the law of Moses, in which you live. Remember, Herod was a half-breed. He was a half-Jew and half-Gentile, but still tried to consider himself a Jew and live under the law. And John is rebuking him and saying, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Why? Because the law said in Le- Leviticus 18, 16, and Leviticus 20 and 21, it says, you shall not marry your brother's wife. Why? Because you're uncovering your brother's nakedness. And the law said, don't do that. And so John is around Herod. He's rebuking Herod constantly and telling Herod, Herod, you're doing something that's wrong. John was bold, wasn't he? Can you imagine that? That you, you know, you're you're before a ruler and the ruler's doing wrong and you're a man of God. You're inspired by God through the Holy Spirit. You have an obligation to correct that ruler. Would we have that boldness to correct a ruler like that? We be like John and stand up and say, what you're doing is wrong. It's not lawful. As a matter of fact, this is what the scripture said. See, when John rebuked Herod and when John kept preaching at Herod and telling him what he was doing was wrong, Herod got upset and Herod had him put in prison. And not only because of Herod, who hated John the most? It was Herodias. 
It was his sister-in-law, a.k.a. his wife, who hated John because she wanted to be with Herod Antipas. And she said, I want to do this. I want to be with him no matter what. And John said, what you're doing is wrong. And she held a grudge towards John. And a point for us is, look, sometimes in this life, when we stand up for the truth and when we live for the truth, people might hold a grudge towards us. People might not like you. Remember when the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians in his letter, his tough letter, he rebukes them because they were apostatizing and trying to go back to the law of Moses. And when he corrects them in the letter, he says, have I become your enemy for telling you the truth? Brethren, the truth hurts sometimes. But you know what? Somebody's got to say it. The truth isn't always pretty, but guess what? The truth is the truth. I'd rather have somebody tell me the truth than dilly-dally around and tell me a lie. Not only did he rebuke him regarding his situation of taking his brother's wife, being a bad guy. Here's what Luke records. Luke, Luke gives us more of an insight. Luke 3 and verse 19. But when Herod the Tetrarch was reproved by him, that's by John, on account of Herodias, his brother's wife, he, he was rebuking him on that. He reproved him. And not only that, look at this. And on account of all the wicked things which Herod had done. Herod was living like a bad guy. Herod thought because, hey, I'm the tetriarch. By the way, that tetriarch, the, the Greek word there is tetra, four, arche, over. He's over four uh, uh, providences. That's, that's what Herod is. He's a ruler over four providences. And John is rebuking him in his wickedness. John isn't letting him get away with that. John is rebuking him because he's a bad guy. He does what he wants. As a ruler, he feels like, yeah, nobody's going to tell me anything. I'm the tetriarch. I rule over these four provinces, and nobody can tell me a word. But John comes along, and John begins to rebuke him. And he doesn't like that. And his sister-in-law, a.k.a. his wife, doesn't like that. And so they put him into prison. So what's the point for us? The point for us is, brethren, look, John needed encouragement while being in prison. John was in prison. John was in jail. We know the story. John is going to be beheaded. John is going to be put to death for rebuking a wicked man and for, for rebuking a wicked woman and standing up for what's right. And so John is in prison. He hears about Jesus. Remember, his disciples, John's disciples, heard about the things Jesus had done, healing the, the widow's son and healing the centurion's servant. He hears about that while in prison. And now he needs encouragement. Lord, what about me? Lord, I'm here in prison. Lord, I'm, I'm suffering for doing what's right. Lord, I'm here. This, this is a bad thing. Where are you in my life? Luke 7 and verse 19, and summoning two of his disciples. John is telling two of his disciples. John sent them to the Lord, that is to the Lord Jesus, saying, are you the expected one or do we look for somebody else? In other words, he, he gets his two disciples and he says, go to, to Jesus, go to the Lord. This man who's working all these miracles, this man who's taking care of the people and performing these great deeds. Go to him and ask him this question. Are you the expected one? Are you the Messiah? Are you truly the Messiah? Or do we look for someone else? Is there somebody else out there who's going to deliver me? In verse 20, and when the men had come to him, that is when the men had come to Jesus, they said, John, now notice this in your Bible. They said, John the Baptist has sent us, the two men, to you, Saying, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? Why is John asking that? Because John is in need of encouragement. Even though John the Baptist was a great man, he was a prophet of God. And he told Herod the truth. Brethren, he still needed some encouragement. He needed to know for a fact, is Jesus who he says he is? And so the next slide we look at is, Lord, are you the expected one? And if you are the ex expected one, why am I still in jail? Why am I here? You know, I taught the truth. I, I did the Father's will, basically, by teaching the truth and exposing Herod for who he is. Why am I still here? If you're the expected one, why don't you get me out of jail? Why am I suffering for what's right? Is my ministry this short? Why aren't you still using me, Lord? I thought I was come to prepare the way of the Lord and to continue to 
preach and bring others to Jesus so that Jesus might increase and I might decrease. Is this all over with? And the last point on the slide is I need to know if you are the expected, expected one. Why? Because I'm going to die. Now, Lord, I'm going to give my life for you and I want you to be that expected one. John needed encouragement. Brethren, think about that for a minute. John is suffering for doing the right thing. Sometimes in this life, do we suffer for doing the right thing? Do we suffer for being a goody two-shoes or following after Jesus and not going after the crowds? Do people make fun of you? Or do you suffer on your job because you don't behave like everybody else? And so when the promotion comes, they don't want you because they know that you're a good person. And so you probably might say to yourself, Am I suffering? Why am I suffering for doing what's right? Lord, why do these things happen to me? I'm trying to serve you. Brethren, we need to recognize that we have an enemy. And the enemy is going to try to make you feel discouraged. To try to make you want to give up. Now let's talk about John this morning. And, and let's look at John. The, I have JTB on the, the slides there. But JTB is just John the Baptist to abbreviate it. So I, I'm lazy. I don't have to write John the Baptist. But now let's think about John the Baptist and his character and who he was, brethren. But John the Baptist, brethren, from the time he, before he was born, his parents had been praying, praying for a child. And remember, the angel Gabriel comes to Zechariah while he's in the temple offering up the, the incense. That the angel comes and appears to him and, and he tells him, look, your prayers, your petitions have been answered. Yes, uh, John the Baptist's parents were older. Elizabeth was older. Zacharias was older, but they had been praying for a child and God answered their prayer. And that child was going to be John the Baptist. And that child, brethren, the scripture says that child was going to bring John joy. I mean, excuse me, John's parents joy. And not only that, think about John, that he gets his name from directly from God through the angel Gabriel. In Luke 1 verses 13 through 19, Gabriel is the one who tells Zacharias what his name was going to be. His name was going to be John. Now you might say, it says the angel of the Lord said that. Yeah, that angel of the Lord is Gabriel. Look at verse 19 of that chapter. And not only that, John the Baptist, brethren, was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Filled with the Holy Spirit when he was in his mother's womb. Isn't that interesting? And John the Baptist, brethren, never drank wine or liquor. Some people look at these verses here, this verse in Luke 1 and verse 15. They like to say that, uh, he was a Nazarite. That might be the case, but there's nothing stated about him being a Nazarite. It doesn't say that he wasn't to have a razor up, uh, upon his head. The verse just says that he never drank wine. And so he never drank wine or he never drank liquor, period. John, brethren, fulfilled the Old Testament prophecies. Malachi 3 in verse 1, Isaiah 40 in verse 3, 2 Kings 1 in verse 8. Uh, he was uh, Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. Compare that verse with 2 Kings chapter 1 and verse 8. Because John was supposed to be Elijah to come. And he is that Elijah to come. He's dressed just like Elijah. And he's a man who lives in the wilderness who eats locusts and wild honey. John and his character and who he was. John was the greatest prophet ever born of woman. Matthew 11 and verse 11. Now, I'm not going to get on the topic about us being the least in the kingdom of heaven being greater than him, that's a different topic uh, for later discussion. But the greatest prophet ever born of woman, he was a forerunner for Jesus, Luke 1 and verse 17. He prepared the way of the Lord or he prepared the way of Yahweh. Mark chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, to fulfill the prophecy found in uh, Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1, Isaiah 40 and verse 3. He was sent from God, John chapter 1 and verse 6. He was a prophet of God, Matthew 21 through 26. He was a preacher, Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. He testified to the truth, John 5 and verse 33. John baptized in the Jordan River for the forgiveness of sins, Mark chapter 1 and verse 4. John the Baptist, brethren, mm -hmm. if we have forgotten about this, John the Baptist baptized Jesus, the eternal word who took on flesh. Jesus, the very son of God, he had the opportunity to baptize Jesus. 
And not only that, when he baptized Jesus, remember what John witnesses. He got to witness the Trinity. Remember when Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water and the voice speaks from heaven. It was the father. This is my, well, this is my son and who I am well pleased. And not only that, he saw the Holy Spirit descending upon Jesus like a dove. And John's account, John mentions the fact I'm talking about the, the gospel writer, John, John chapter one, verses 31 through 34. John talks about the fact that John did not know that Jesus was truly the Messiah until the father told him the Messiah is the one on whom you see the Holy Spirit descending upon. That is the Messiah. And when Jesus is baptized by John, he witnesses that and he understands who Jesus truly is. He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. He got to witness that brethren, the Trinity. Jesus being baptized in the water, the Holy Spirit descending like a dove and the voice of the Father speaking from heaven. John the Baptist declared Jesus to be the Lamb of God. John chapter 1 and verse 29 and verse 36. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That came out of John's mouth. And John, brethren, had disciples, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 14. John was also called a righteous and holy man, Mark chapter 6 and verse 20. Jesus said about John, he was a lamp that was burning and shining, John chapter 5 and verse 34. Think about the character of John. Think about all the things the Bible says about John. But yet he still needed what? Encouragement. He still needed to know who Jesus was because he was going to die for the Lord. He was hurting while in prison. He needed to understand that Jesus was the son of God. He is the expected one. Do you know somebody like that who served the Lord? Who's done the right thing? Who's a member of the body of Christ? Who taught the gospel? Who was a Bible class teacher? Who might have served as an elder or a deacon or a minister? And something has happened in their life to where they have not fallen away. But maybe some have fallen away. But maybe somebody might be hurting and saying, you know, what am I doing with this Christianity stuff? You know, am I really serving God? Am I really serving the true God? Is the Bible really true? Should I rely on the reliability of the New Testament? Should I re rely upon the reliability of the Old Testament? Should I rely upon the Bible? Are these things true? And sometimes, brethren, people need to be encouraged. How does Jesus respond to his disciples, those two disciples that he sent? Jesus responds by letting John know, to encourage John, I am the expected one, John. You're serving the right person, and you are going to glorify God in your death. I am the expected one. Look how Jesus proves he's the expected one in Luke 7 and verse 21. At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he granted sight to many who were blind. The two disciples come to Jesus. Are you the expected one? How does Jesus show he's the expected one? He begins to perform miracles. Right in front of John's disciples, the very, I don't know if these are the same two, the ones who witnessed the things that Jesus did earlier. But these two disciples witnessed what Jesus was able to do. And look at that. Not only does he work miracles, watch Jesus' response in verse 22. And he answered and said to them, to the two disciples, go and report to John or go tell John what you have seen and heard. They saw the miracles Jesus worked. They got to hear the very vo voice of Jesus, the Messiah. And then he says to them, watch this. The blind receive sight. That's a quotation from Isaiah 35 and verse 5. The lame walk, the lepers are cured, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. A quotation from Isaiah 61 and verse 1. What is Jesus' point there? I am the expected one. I am the Messiah because look at the miracles that I perform. You cannot deny that. And not only that, I am the very fulfillment of these passages. These passages talked about the Messiah. And when the Messiah comes, he's going to be able to perform miracles and cause the blind to see. And not only that, the Messiah is going to bring the gospel to the poor and he's going to preach to them. You go and tell John that. Go and encourage John that I am the true Messiah. Let John know he's going to glorify God in his death. Brethren, John's disciples go and tell John what they saw 
and the very words of what Jesus told him. He fulfills those passages concerning the Messiah, and they witness the miracles. Luke 7, verse 23, 24. Watch this what Jesus says. And blessed is he who keeps from stumbling. Look up the Greek. The word can also be translated as fall away over me. Blessed is the one who understands who I am and accepts who I am and doesn't stumble because of who I say I am and the very miracles that he performed and the passages that he fulfilled. Blessed is that person who doesn't fall away. Did John fall away? No, he didn't fall away. John is actually glorified by Jesus. After this, Jesus talks about John and preaches to the people how John was a great man and a great prophet. And look at verse 24. And when the messengers of John had left, they left because they wanted to go tell John what they had saw and the very words of Jesus and the prophecies being fulfilled. John's disciples went to go and encourage him and give him the very news that he wanted to hear. Now, the lessons for us that we can learn, brethren, how we apply this in our life is like John. We need encouragement as well from time to time, don't we? You might say, well, no, I don't need encouragement, Brother Johns. I'm very strong. Go to Bible class. I read my Bible. I do what's right. I walk by faith, not by sight. I don't need this. Well, that's great. But all of us, if we're honest, we need encouragement from time to time. We always need encouragement. Look at what the Bible talks about, especially in the book of Hebrews. The Hebrew writer uh, is encouraging the brethren. Remember, the Hebrew writer is writing to Jewish Christians, those who have obeyed the gospel, and they were trying to go back under the old law because of persecution, and the Hebrew writer is trying to encourage them, don't go back under the old law because the old law has been, a done, the old law has been done away with, and you're you're under a better covenant and under better promises, under a better high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And so he's constantly encouraging them. And the Holy Spirit is encouraging us today through the word here in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, where it says, and let us, look at this, let us consider how to stimulate. You know, it's interesting here when you look this up in the original language, when it says, let us consider how to stimulate, it's not a suggestion. It's very strong. It's an imperative and an imperative in Greek is a command. He's telling us we need to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. We need to constantly do that for one another. We need to constantly motivate one another. In, in, in this day and time, we live in a digital age and I love it because nobody can get up and, and try to seem like there's some type of scholar or some type of person who's so educated that nobody understands the language, how I know the language. We live in a digital age. If I tell you to look up a word, you can actually touch on the English word and pull up the Greek word and you can look it up yourself. And I want you to do that this morning. Look up the Greek word for stimulate. You don't have to be a Greek scholar. You can just click on the word, look at it and see how it's defined. But I want to break the word down for you this morning so that way we can make application. It's the Greek word paroxousamos. And it's actually a noun, but it comes from a verb. And this word parox usamas is actually interesting because when it's used in a good sense, it's talking about to urge or to motivate somebody. Motivate your brethren, urge your brethren, encourage your brethren, stimulate your brethren. But what's also interesting about this word is when it's used in a bad sense, it means to irritate or to annoy somebody. <laughs> Parauxamas, I'm going to annoy you. It's actually interesting when you look up the word, if you click on it one more time, you can go back to its origin, its root word. The root word is actually a verb, so there's action going on. And when you look up that word, it's made of two Greek words, and when you put them together, it means to sharpen alongside of somebody. You have this, you have something that's a sharp object, and you keep sharpening it alongside of, alongside of somebody, and you're annoying them because they know that you're going to poke them with that very object. Have you ever been around a, a child like that who's just so mischievous. Maybe I know I was like that when I was a kid. I was very bad. But maybe you've been around a bad kid who's just very mischievous and you know they're going to poke you with something. And they're, they're sharpening their object. And it's like, please get away from me, kid. Get away from me. And you, you know they're going to come and poke you. 
That's what the idea of this word, brethren. Let us stimulate. Let us poke one another in a good sense. Let us motivate one another. Keep poking one another until we get it. Until we feel like we're loved. Until we know that we need to do good deeds. We need to be doing that constantly. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11, where Paul is concluding that letter to the Thessalonians, he says, therefore, encourage. This is an interesting Greek word. It's a, it's a, a verb, parakaleo. And again, you can look it up. So I don't want to stand up here and say, look, I know Greek. Yeah, you guys don't know like me. I'm a scholar. You don't know. I, I, you know me. If you know me, I don't come across that. Way. I've been studying the language for a while Yes, I can read it. Yes, I can do this and that with it, but that's not my purpose. The purpose is to identify words to communicate God's thoughts. Therefore, encourage one another. The Greek word there is parakaleo. The word means para, meaning alongside of, kaleo, meaning to call. To call somebody alongside of you, to put your arm around them and tell them you love them and you want them to go to heaven and you appreciate them and, and let's work together is the idea. And you might say, well, Brother John's parakaleo. I can't call somebody to my side. You know, we're in a pandemic. How can we encourage one another? You can encourage one another by picking up the phone call and kaleo, calling somebody. <laughs> See the word play there? Kaleo, call. Calling them, letting them know you care about them. Hey, um, is there anything I can do for you? Are you out of work? Um, you need some food right now. Can we send you some money or can we send an Uber driver over to bring you some food? Or somebody might just need an encouragement. They might need to know that, hey, hey, I need somebody to talk to. I need somebody to pray for me. Maybe you can offer that service to them by calling them to your side and letting them know you love them. And then the second word here is and build up. Another interesting word. Oikondemeo. It means to build a house, build up, building up a house. Think of it in this sense, helping your brother or sister in Christ do a home makeover. Help them build up their house spiritually and help them out in whatever it takes. A spiritual home makeover. Build up one another just as you also are doing. The last slide here and the lesson is yours. Like John's disciples, brethren, we might be the messengers. We just might be the ones who have to take that message and go to the person who needs the encouragement. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 14, you know, it's interesting there. In 1 Thessalonians 5, he's closing out the book. And there he's talking about all this encouragement. You guys encourage one another, build up one another. And he's saying, continue to do that. And then he makes some specifics here in verse 14. And we urge you, we encourage you, brethren, admonish the unruly, warn those who are living this unruly life. The word there means to a person who doesn't want to be told what to do. Warn those with that type of attitude. Let them know, look, you cannot be subordinate. You have to be submissive to the word of God. You have to remain humble because God takes care of the humble. He's against the proud. And look at this. Encourage the faint hearted. As we, if we look around us and we watch people in our congregation, we can see people from time to time become faint hearted. And they are the ones who actually need the help. We all need the help, but they especially need the help. And he says, help the weak. Be patient with what? All men. Be patient with them. Don't push them. Don't rush them. Don't be judgmental. You need to get it right. You can't get anything right. You don't know this. You should know this by now. No, he says, guess what? Just be patient with them. Because the point is, is God patient with us? <laughs> Second Peter 3 and verse 9, right? The Lord is willing that not anyone should perish. What? But all should come to repentance. The Lord is patient. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise in Jesus' return. But the Lord is patient with us. And I thank God for that because we make mistakes. We need to learn from life. And I'm glad God is patient with us. And we need to be patient with others. But one quick point and then we'll close out here. When he says encourage the faint hearted, it comes from another unique Greek word. And again, I encourage you to look it up. 
And it's made of two Greek words. You know, the more you study the language, you'll find out that a lot of these Greek words are made up of two Greek words. And, and you can always go back to the root and break words down and get good definitions and define them and make application. This comes from the Greek word oligosukos. And oligosukos comes from two Greek words, oligos, which means little or light. And you should recognize that second word there if you're familiar with the Koine Greek. It's the Greek word pasukos. And pasukos means, excuse me, you go back to pasuke. Pasuke means soul. Break the word down, somebody who has a light soul. Somebody who has a little soul, somebody who is suffering spiritually and suffering from spiritual anorexia. They're faint hearted, they're weak. Their soul is little, their soul is weak. And they're in need of your help. And they need you to encourage them. Brethren, let us all take this lesson to heart. Let me live by this lesson. You know, when we study the word together and when I present the word, to brethren, I always let them know this lesson applies to me. You know, when I'm pointing the finger at you, if it's two or one, I have fingers pointing back at me. If I'm pointing one, I have three pointing back at me. If I point with two, I have two pointing back at me. Let us try to live out this lesson. Let us recognize that, look, we might serve God and we might be faithful to God and we might do many great things like John did, but from time to time, we need encouragement. And let us have that attitude that we will accept that encouragement and say, well, I can do it all on my own. I don't need anybody. I've been a Christian for so long, you know, I could take on life's problems myself. But that's not the attitude that God wants us to have. God wants us to help one another and to bear one another's load, as Paul talks about in the Galatian letter. And not only that, sometimes, brethren, we might be the messenger. We might be the one to go and encourage somebody. And let us always look at the congregation and let us always look for people who are struggling, who might be weak, who might be faint hearted, who might have a little soul that's just shriveling away. Let us take these things to heart and let us try to live for Christ and for God. And I hope that this lesson has encouraged you. And I hope you'll go back and study these things. And I hope throughout this week that you will Try to encourage somebody. And I hope throughout this week that you're going to pray more. And I hope throughout this week that you're going to study the scriptures more. And I hope throughout this week you're going to read the Bible more. Because that's what the life of a Christian is. That's what God expects of us. I'll leave the invitation. If anybody needs to respond to the gospel, you can contact one of the elders or the brethren there at East Foothill. Or if there's somebody who's a member um, that's actually in need of prayer. Um, please let that be known. Or if you need to pray for somebody else that you know, somebody else who's in need of prayer, feel free to let that be known. And we will be happy to assist in any way. And again, I thank you so much for the opportunity and the time. And uh, hopefully, again, this lesson will help you change your life and to be better in Christ's sight. And let me get this slide off the screen. Okay, thank you so much.